Chapter 11 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded at the Bertrand Russell Archives at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Chapter 11. On Intuitive Knowledge. There is a common impression that everything that we believe ought to be capable of proof, or at least of being shown to be highly probable. It is felt by many that a belief for which no reason can be given is an unreasonable belief. In the main, this view is just. Almost all our common beliefs are either inferred or capable of being inferred from other beliefs which may be regarded as giving the reason for them. As a rule, the reason has been forgotten or has even never been consciously present to our minds. Few of us ever ask ourselves, for example, what reason there is to suppose the food we are just going to eat will not turn out to be poison, yet we feel, when challenged, that a perfectly good reason could be found, even if we are not ready with it at the moment, and in this belief we are usually justified. But let us imagine some insistent Socrates, who, whatever reason we give him, continues to demand a reason for the reason. We must, sooner or later, and probably before very long, be driven to a point where we cannot find any further reason, and where it becomes almost certain that no further reason is even theoretically discoverable. Starting with the common beliefs of daily life, we can be driven back from point to point until we come to some general principle or some instance of a general principle which seems luminously evident and is not itself capable of being deduced from anything more evident. In most questions of daily life, such as whether our food is likely to be nourishing and not poisonous, we shall be driven back to the inductive principle, which we discussed in chapter 6. But beyond that, there seems to be no further regress. The principle itself is constantly used in our reasoning, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but there is no reasoning which, starting from some simpler self-evident principle, leads us to the principle of induction as its conclusion, and the same holds for other logical principles. Their truth is evident to us, and we employ them in constructing demonstrations, but they themselves, or at least some of them, are incapable of demonstration. Self-evidence, however, is not confined to those among general principles which are incapable of proof. When a certain number of logical principles have been admitted, the rest can be deduced from them. But the propositions deduced are often just as self-evident as those that were assumed without proof. All arithmetic, moreover, can be deduced from the general principles of logic, yet the simple propositions of arithmetic such as two and two are four, are just as self-evident as the principles of logic. It would seem also, though this is more disputable, that there are some self-evident ethical principles, such as, we ought to pursue what is good. It should be observed that, in all cases of general principles, particular instances dealing with familiar things are more evident than the general principle. For example, the law of contradiction states that nothing can both have a certain property and not have it. This is evident as soon as it is understood, but it is not so evident as that a particular rose which we see cannot be both red and not red. It is of course possible that parts of the rose may be red and parts not red, or that the rose may be of a shade of pink which we hardly know whether to call red or not. But in the former case, it is plain that the rose as a whole is not red, 
while in the latter case the answer is theoretically definite as soon as we have decided on a precise definition of red it is usually through particular instances that we come to be able to see the general principle only those who are practiced in dealing with abstractions can readily grasp a general principle without the help of instances in addition to general principles the other kind of self-evident truths are those immediately derived from sensation we will call such truths truths of perception and the judgments expressing them we will call judgments of perception but here a certain amount of care is required in getting at the precise nature of the truths that are self-evident the actual sense data are neither true nor false a particular patch of color which i see for example simply exists it is not the sort of thing that is true or false it is true that there is such a patch true that it has a certain shape and degree of brightness true that it is surrounded by certain other colors but the patch itself like everything else in the world of sense is of a radically different kind from the things that are true or false and therefore cannot properly be said to be true thus whatever self-evident truths may be obtained from our senses must be different from the sense data from which they are obtained it would seem that there are two kinds of self-evident truths of perception though perhaps in the last analysis the two kinds may coalesce first there is the kind which simply asserts the existence of the sense datum without in any way analyzing it we see a patch of red and we judge there is such and such a patch of red or more strictly there is that this is one kind of intuitive judgment of perception the other kind arises when the object of sense is complex and we subject it to some degree of analysis if for instance we see a round patch of red we may judge that patch of red is round this is again a judgment of perception but it differs from our previous kind in our present kind we have a single sense datum which has both color and shape the color is red and the shape is round our judgment analyzes the datum into color and shape and then recombines them by stating that the red color is round in shape another example of this kind of judgment is this is to the right of that where this and that are seen simultaneously in this kind of judgment the sense datum contains constituents which have some relation to each other and the judgment asserts that these constituents have this relation another class of intuitive judgments analogous to those of sense and yet quite distinct from them are judgments of memory there is some danger of confusion as to the nature of memory owing to the fact that memory of an object is apt to be accompanied by an image of the object and yet the image cannot be what constitutes the memory this is easily seen by merely noticing that the image is in the present whereas what is remembered is known to be in the past moreover we are certainly able to some extent to compare our image with the object remembered so that we often know within somewhat wide limits how far our image is accurate but this would be impossible unless the object as opposed to the image were in some way before the mind thus the essence of memory is not constituted by the image but by having immediately before the mind an object which is recognized as past but for the fact of memory in this sense we should not know that there ever was a past at all nor should we ever be able to understand the word past any more than a man born blind can understand the word light there must be intuitive judgments of memory and it is upon them ultimately that all our knowledge of the past depends 
The case of memory, however, raises a difficulty, for it is notoriously fallacious, and thus throws doubt on the trustworthiness of intuitive judgments in general. This difficulty is no light one, but let us first narrow its scope as far as possible. Broadly speaking, memory is trustworthy in proportion to the vividness of the experience and to its nearness in time. If the house next door was struck by lightning half a minute ago, my memory of what I saw and heard will be so reliable that it would be preposterous to doubt whether there had been a flash at all. And the same applies to less vivid experiences, so long as they are recent. I am absolutely certain that a half a minute ago, I was sitting in the same chair in which I am sitting now. Going backward over the day, I find things of which I am quite certain, other things of which I am almost certain, other things of which I can become certain by thought and by calling up attendant circumstances, and some things of which I am by no means certain. I am quite certain that I ate my breakfast this morning, but if I were as indifferent to my breakfast as a philosopher should be, I should be doubtful. As to the conversation at breakfast, I can recall some of it easily, some with an effort, some only with a large element of doubt, and some not at all. Thus, there is a continual gradation in the degree of self-evidence of what I remember, and a corresponding gradation in the trustworthiness of my memory. Thus, the first answer to the difficulty of fallacious memory is to say that memory has degrees of self-evidence, and that these correspond to the degrees of its trustworthiness, reaching a limit of perfect self-evidence and perfect trustworthiness in our memory of events which are recent and vivid. It would seem, however, that there are cases of very firm belief in a memory which is wholly false. It is probable that, in these cases, what is really remembered, in the sense of being immediately before the mind, is something other than what is falsely believed in, though something generally associated with it. George IV is said to have at last believed that he was at the Battle of Waterloo because he had so often said that he was. In this case, what was immediately remembered was his repeated assertion. The belief in what he was asserting, if it existed, would be produced by association with the remembered assertion, and would therefore not be a genuine case of memory. It would seem that cases of fallacious memory can probably all be dealt with in this way. That is, they can be shown to be not cases of memory in the strict sense at all. One important point about self-evidence is made clear by the case of memory, and that is that self-evidence has degrees. It is not a quality which is simply present or absent, but a quality which may be more or less present, in gradations ranging from absolute certainty down to an almost imperceptible faintness. Truths of perception and some of the principles of logic have the very highest degree of self-evidence. Truths of immediate memory have an almost equally high degree. The inductive principle has less self-evidence than some of the other principles of logic, such as what follows from a true premise must be true. Memories have a diminishing self-evidence as they become remoter and fainter. The truths of logic and mathematics have, broadly speaking, less self-evidence as they become more complicated. Judgments of intrinsic ethical or aesthetic value are apt to have some self-evidence, but not much. Degrees of self-evidence are important in the theory of knowledge, since if propositions may, as seems likely, have some degree of self-evidence without being true, it will not be necessary to abandon all connection between self-evidence and truth but merely to say that, where there is a conflict, the more self-evident proposition is to be retained, and the less self-evident rejected. It seems, however, highly probable that two different notions are combined in self-evidence, as above explained. That one of them, which corresponds to the highest degree of self-evidence, 
is really an infallible guarantee of truth, while the other, which corresponds to all the other degrees, does not give an infallible guarantee, but only a greater or less presumption. This, however, is only a suggestion, which we cannot as yet develop further. After we have dealt with a nature of truth, we shall return to the subject of self-evidence in connection with the distinction between knowledge and error. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded in Durango, Colorado. Chapter 12. Truth and Falsehood. Our knowledge of truths, unlike our knowledge of things, has an opposite, namely, error. So far as things are concerned, we may know them or not know them. But there is no positive state of mind which can be described as erroneous knowledge of things, so long, at any rate, as we confine ourselves to knowledge by acquaintance. Whatever we are acquainted with must be something. We may draw wrong inferences from our acquaintance, but the acquaintance itself cannot be deceptive. Thus, there is no dualism as regards acquaintance. But as regards knowledge of truths, there is a dualism. We may believe what is false as well as what is true. We know that, on very many subjects, different people hold different and incompatible opinions. Hence, some beliefs must be erroneous. Since erroneous beliefs are often held just as strongly as true beliefs, it becomes a difficult question how they are to be distinguished from true beliefs. How are we to know, in a given case, that our belief is not erroneous? This is a question of the very greatest difficulty, to which no completely satisfactory answer is possible. There is, however, a preliminary question, which is rather less difficult, and that is, what do we mean by truth and falsehood? It is this preliminary question which is to be considered in this chapter. In this chapter, we are not asking how we can know whether a belief is true or false. We are asking what is meant by the question whether a belief is true or false. It is to be hoped that a clear answer to this question may help us to obtain an answer to the question what beliefs are true. But for the present, we ask only what is truth and what is falsehood, not what beliefs are true and what beliefs are false. It is very important to keep these different questions entirely separate, since any confusion between them is sure to produce an answer which is not really applicable to either. There are three points to observe in the attempt to discover the nature of truth, three requisites which any theory must fulfill. One. Our theory of truth must be such as to admit of its opposite, falsehood. A good many philosophers have failed adequately to satisfy this condition. They have constructed theories according to which all our thinking ought to have been true, and have then had the greatest difficulty in finding a place for falsehood. In this respect, our theory of belief must differ from our theory of acquaintance, since in the case of acquaintance, it was not necessary to take account of any opposite. 2. It seems fairly evident that if there were no beliefs, there could be no falsehood, and no truth either, in the sense in which truth is a correlative to falsehood. If we imagine a world of mere matter, there would be no room for falsehood in such a world, and although it would contain what may be called facts, it would not contain any truths in the sense in which truths are things of the same kind as falsehoods. In fact, truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs and statements. Hence, a world of mere matter, since it would contain no beliefs or statements, would also contain no truth or falsehood. 3. But, as against what we have just said, it is to be observed that the truth or falsehood of a belief always depends upon something 
which lies outside the belief itself. If I believe that Charles I died on the scaffold, I believe truly, not because of any intrinsic quality of my belief, which could be discovered by merely examining the belief, but because of an historical event, which happened two and a half centuries ago. If I believe that Charles I died in his bed, I believe falsely. No degree of vividness in my belief, or of care in arriving at it, prevents it from being false. Again, because of what happened long ago, and not because of any intrinsic property of my belief. Hence, although truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs, they are properties dependent upon the relations of the beliefs to other things, not upon any internal quality of the beliefs. The third of the above requisites leads us to adopt the view, which has on the whole been commonest among philosophers, that truth consists in some form of correspondence between belief and fact. It is, however, by no means an easy matter to discover a form of correspondence to which there are no irrefutable objections. By this partly, and partly by the feeling that, if truth consists in a correspondence of thought with something outside thought, thought can never know when truth has been attained, many philosophers have been led to try to find some definition of truth which shall not consist in relation to something wholly outside belief. The most important attempt at a definition of this sort is the theory that truth consists in coherence. It is said that the mark of falsehood is failure to cohere in the body of our beliefs, and that it is the essence of a truth to form part of the completely rounded system which is the truth. There is, however, a great difficulty in this view, or rather two great difficulties. The first is that there is no reason to suppose that only one coherent body of beliefs is possible. It may be that, with sufficient imagination, a novelist might invent a past for the world that would perfectly fit onto what we know, and yet be quite different from the real past. In more scientific matters, it is certain that there are often two or more hypotheses which account for all the known facts on some subject. And although, in such cases, men of science endeavor to find facts which will rule out all the hypotheses except one, there is no reason why they should always succeed. In philosophy, again, it seems not uncommon for two rival hypotheses to be both able to account for all the facts. Thus, for example, it is possible that life is one long dream, and that the outer world has only that degree of reality that the objects of dreams have. But although such a view does not seem inconsistent with known facts, there is no reason to prefer it to the common sense view, according to which other people and things do really exist. Thus, coherence as the definition of truth fails, because there is no proof that there can be only one coherent system. The other objection to this definition of truth is that it assumes the meaning of coherence known, whereas, in fact, coherence presupposes the truth of the laws of logic. Two propositions are coherent when both may be true, and are incoherent when one at least must be false. Now, in order to know whether two propositions can both be true, we must know such truths as the law of contradiction. For example, the two propositions, this tree is a beech and this tree is not a beech, are not coherent because of the law of contradiction. But if the law of contradiction itself were subjected to the test of coherence, we should find that, if we choose to suppose it false, nothing will any longer be incoherent with anything else. Thus, the laws of logic supply the skeleton or framework within which the test of coherence applies, and they themselves cannot be established by this test. For the above two reasons, coherence cannot be accepted as giving the meaning of truth, though it is often a most important test of truth after a certain amount of truth has become known. Hence, we are driven back to correspondence with fact as constituting the nature of truth. It remains to define precisely 
what we mean by fact and what is the nature of the correspondence which must subsist between belief and fact in order that belief may be true in accordance with our three requisites we have to seek a theory of truth which first allows truth to have an opposite namely falsehood second makes truth a property of beliefs but third makes it a property wholly dependent upon the relation of the beliefs to outside things the necessity of allowing for falsehood makes it impossible to regard belief as a relation of the mind to a single object which could be said to be what is believed if belief were so regarded we should find that like acquaintance it would not admit of the opposition of truth and falsehood but would have to be always true this may be made clear by examples othello believes falsely that desdemona loves cassio we cannot say that this belief consists in a relation to a single object desdemona's love for cassio for if there were such an object the belief would be true there is in fact no such object and therefore othello cannot have any relation to such an object hence his belief cannot possibly consist in a relation to this object it might be said that his belief is a relation to a different object namely that desdemona loves cassio but it is almost as difficult to suppose that there is such an object as this when desdemona does not love cassio as it was to suppose that there is desdemona's love for cassio hence it will be better to seek for a theory of belief which does not make it consist in a relation of the mind to a single object it is common to think of relations as though they always held between two terms but in fact this is not always the case some relations demand three terms some four and so on take for instance the relation between so long as only two terms come in the relation between is impossible three terms are the smallest number that render it possible york is between london and edinburgh but if london and edinburgh were the only places in the world there could be nothing which was between one place and another similarly jealousy requires three people there can be no such relation that does not involve three at least such a proposition as a wishes b to promote c's marriage with d involves a relation of four terms that is to say a and b and c and d all come in and the relation involved cannot be expressed otherwise than in a form involving all four instances might be multiplied indefinitely but enough has been said to show that there are relations which require more than two terms before they can occur the relation involved in judging or believing must if falsehood is to be duly allowed for be taken to be a relation between several terms not between two when othello believes that desdemona loves cassio he must not have before his mind a single object desdemona's love for cassio or that desdemona loves cassio for that would require that there should be objective falsehoods which subsist independently of any minds and this though not logically refutable is a theory to be avoided if possible thus it is easier to account for falsehood if we take judgment to be a relation in which the mind and various objects concerned all occur severally that is to say desdemona and loving and cassio must all be terms in the relation which subsists when othello believes that desdemona loves cassio this relation therefore is a relation of four terms since othello also is one of the terms of the relation when we say that it is a relation of four terms we do not mean that othello has a certain relation to desdemona and has the same relation to loving and also to cassio this may be true of some other relation than believing but believing plainly is not a relation which othello has to each of the three terms concerned but to all of them together there is only one example of the relation of believing involved but this one example knits together 
four terms. Thus, the actual occurrence at the moment when Othello is entertaining his belief is that the relation called believing is knitting together into one complex whole the four terms Othello, Desdemona, Loving, and Cassio. What is called belief or judgment is nothing but this relation of believing or judging, which relates a mind to several things other than itself. An act of belief or of judgment is the occurrence between certain terms at some particular time of the relation of believing or judging. We are now in a position to understand what it is that distinguishes a true judgment from a false one. For this purpose, we will adopt certain definitions. In every act of judgment, there is a mind which judges, and there are terms concerning which it judges. We will call the mind the subject in the judgment, and the remaining terms the objects. Thus, when Othello judges that Desdemona loves Cassio, Othello is the subject, while the objects are Desdemona and Loving and Cassio. The subject and the objects together are called the constituents of the judgment. It will be observed that the relation of judging has what is called a sense or direction. We may say, metaphorically, that it puts its objects in a certain order, which may indicate by means of the order of the words in the sentence. In an inflected language, the same thing will be indicated by inflections, for example, by the difference between nominative and accusative. Othello's judgment that Cassio loves Desdemona differs from his judgment that Desdemona loves Cassio, in spite of the fact that it consists of the same constituents, because the relation of judging places the constituents in a different order in the two cases. Similarly, if Cassio judges that Desdemona loves Othello, the constituents of the judgment are still the same, but their order is different. This property of having a sense or direction is one which the relation of judging shares with all other relations. The sense of relations is the ultimate source of order and series and a host of mathematical concepts, but we need not concern ourselves further with this aspect. We spoke of the relation called judging or believing as knitting together into one complex whole, the subject and the objects. In this respect, judging is exactly like every other relation. Whenever a relation holds between two or more terms, it unites the terms into a complex whole. If Othello loves Desdemona, there is such a complex whole as Othello's love for Desdemona. The terms united by the relation may be themselves complex, or may be simple, but the whole which results from their being united must be complex. Wherever there is a relation which relates certain terms, there is a complex object formed of the union of those terms, and conversely, wherever there is a complex object, there is a relation which relates its constituents. When an act of believing occurs, there is a complex in which believing is the uniting relation, and subject and objects are arranged in a certain order by the sense of the relation of believing. Among the objects, as we saw in considering Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, one must be a relation, in this instance the relation loving. But this relation, as it occurs in the act of believing, is not the relation which creates the unity of the complex whole consisting of the subject and the objects. The relation loving, as it occurs in the act of believing, is one of the objects. It is a brick in the structure, not the cement. The cement is the relation believing. When the belief is true, there is another complex unity in which the relation which was one of the objects of the belief relates the other objects. Thus, for example, if Othello believes truly that Desdemona loves Cassio, then there is a complex unity, Desdemona's love for Cassio, which is composed exclusively of the objects of the belief, in the same order as they had in the belief, with the relation which was one of the objects occurring now 
as the cement that binds together the other objects of the belief. On the other hand, when a belief is false, there is no such complex unity composed only of the objects of the belief. If Othello believes falsely that Desdemona loves Cassio, then there is no such complex unity as Desdemona's love for Cassio. Thus, a belief is true when it corresponds to a certain associated complex, and false when it does not. Assuming, for the sake of definiteness, that the objects of the belief are two terms and a relation, the terms being put in a certain order by the sense of the believing, then if the two terms in that order are united by the relation into a complex, the belief is true. If not, it is false. This constitutes the definition of truth and falsehood that we were in search of. Judging or believing is a certain complex unity of which a mind is a constituent. If the remaining constituents, taken in the order which they have in the belief, form a complex unity, then the belief is true. If not, it is false. Thus, although truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs, yet they are, in a sense, extrinsic properties. For the condition of the truth of a belief is something not involving beliefs or, in general, any mind at all, but only the objects of the belief. A mind which believes, believes truly when there is a corresponding complex, not involving the mind, but only its objects. This correspondence ensures truth, and its absence entails falsehood. Hence, we account simultaneously for the two facts that beliefs, A, depend on minds for their existence, B, do not depend on minds for their truth. We may restate our theory as follows. If we take such a belief as Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, we will call Desdemona and Cassio the object terms and loving the object relation. If there is a complex unity, Desdemona's love for Cassio, consisting of the object terms related by the object relation, in the same order as they have in the belief, then this complex unity is called the fact corresponding to the belief. Thus, a belief is true when there is a corresponding fact and is false when there is no corresponding fact. It will be seen that minds do not create truth or falsehood. They create beliefs. But when once the beliefs are created, the mind cannot make them true or false except in the special case where they concern future things which are within the power of the person believing, such as catching trains. What makes a belief true is a fact, and this fact does not, except in exceptional cases, in any way involve the mind of the person who has the belief. Having now decided what we mean by truth and falsehood, we have next to consider what ways there are of knowing whether this or that belief is true or false. This consideration will occupy the next chapter. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D. C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded in Durango, Colorado. Chapter 13 Knowledge, Error, and Probable Opinion. The question as to what we mean by truth and falsehood, which we considered in the preceding chapter, is of much less interest than the question as to how we can know what is true and what is false. This question will occupy us in the present chapter. There can be no doubt that some of our beliefs are erroneous. Thus we are led to inquire what certainty we can ever have that such and such a belief is not erroneous. In other words, can we ever know anything at all? Or do we merely sometimes, by good luck, believe what is true? 
Before we can attack this question, we must, however, first decide what we mean by knowing, and this question is not so easy as might be supposed. At first sight, we might imagine that knowledge could be defined as true belief. When what we believe is true, it might be supposed that we had achieved a knowledge of what we believe. But this would not accord with the way in which the word is commonly used. To take a very trivial instance, if a man believes that the late prime minister's last name began with a B, he believes what is true, since the late prime minister was Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman. But if he believes that Mr. Balfour was the late prime minister, he will still believe that the late prime minister's last name began with a B. Yet this belief, though true, would not be thought to constitute knowledge. If a newspaper, by an intelligent anticipation, announces the result of a battle before any telegram giving the result has been received, it may, by good fortune, announce what afterwards turns out to be the right result, and it may produce belief in some of its less experienced readers. But in spite of the truth of their belief, they cannot be said to have knowledge. Thus it is clear that a true belief is not knowledge when it is deduced from a false belief. In like manner, a true belief cannot be called knowledge when it is deduced by a fallacious process of reasoning, even if the premises from which it is deduced are true. If I know that all Greeks are men, and that Socrates was a man, and I infer that Socrates was a Greek, I cannot be said to know that Socrates was a Greek, because, although my premises and my conclusion are true, the conclusion does not follow from the premises. But are we to say that nothing is knowledge except what is validly deduced from true premises? Obviously we cannot say this. Such a definition is at once too wide and too narrow. In the first place, it is too wide because it is not enough that our premises should be true, they must also be known. The man who believes that Mr. Balfour was the late Prime Minister may proceed to draw valid deductions from the true premise that the late Prime Minister's name began with a B, but he cannot be said to know the conclusions reached by these deductions. Thus we shall have to amend our definition by saying that knowledge is what is validly deduced from known premises. This, however, is a circular definition. It assumes that we already know what is meant by known premises. It can, therefore, at best, define one sort of knowledge, the sort we call derivative, as opposed to intuitive knowledge. We may say, derivative knowledge is what is validly deduced from premises known intuitively. In this statement, there is no formal defect, but it leaves the definition of intuitive knowledge still to seek. Leaving on one side for the moment the question of intuitive knowledge, let us consider the above suggested definition of derivative knowledge. The chief objection to it is that it unduly limits knowledge. It constantly happens that people entertain a true belief, which has grown up in them because of some piece of intuitive knowledge from which it is capable of being validly inferred but from which it has not, as a matter of fact, been inferred by any logical process. Take, for example, the beliefs produced by reading. If the newspapers announce the death of the king, we are fairly well justified in believing that the king is dead, since this is the sort of announcement which would not be made if it were false. And we are quite amply justified in believing that the newspaper asserts that the king is dead, but here the intuitive knowledge, upon which our belief is based, is knowledge of the existence of sense data, derived from looking at the print which gives the news. This knowledge scarcely rises into consciousness, except in a person who cannot read easily. A child may be aware of the shapes of the letters and pass gradually and painfully to a realization of their meaning. But anybody accustomed to reading passes at once to what the letters mean, and is not aware, except on reflection, that he has derived this knowledge from the sense data called seeing the printed letters. 
Thus, although a valid inference from the letters to their meaning is possible and could be performed by the reader, it is not in fact performed, since he does not in fact perform any operation which can be called logical inference. Yet it would be absurd to say that the reader does not know that the newspaper announces the king's death. We must, therefore, admit as derivative knowledge whatever is the result of intuitive knowledge, even if by mere association, provided there is a valid logical connection and the person in question could become aware of this connection by reflection. There are, in fact, many ways besides logical inference by which we pass from one belief to another. The passage from the print to its meaning illustrates these ways. These ways may be called psychological inference. We shall then admit such psychological inference as a means of obtaining derivative knowledge, provided there is a discoverable logical inference which runs parallel to the psychological inference. This renders our definition of derivative knowledge less precise than we could wish, since the word discoverable is vague. It does not tell us how much reflection may be needed in order to make the discovery. But in fact, knowledge is not a precise conception. It merges into probable opinion, as we shall see more fully in the course of the present chapter. A very precise definition, therefore, should not be sought, since any definition must be more or less misleading. The chief difficulty in regard to knowledge, however, does not arise over derivative knowledge, but over intuitive knowledge. So long as we are dealing with derivative knowledge, we have the test of intuitive knowledge to fall back upon. But in regard to intuitive beliefs, it is by no means easy to discover any criterion by which to distinguish some as true and others as erroneous. In this question, it is scarcely possible to reach any very precise result. All our knowledge of truths is infected with some degree of doubt, and a theory which ignored this fact would be plainly wrong. Something may be done, however, to mitigate the difficulties of the question. Our theory of truth, to begin with, supplies the possibility of distinguishing certain truths as self-evident in a sense which ensures infallibility. When a belief is true, we said, there is a corresponding fact in which the several objects of the belief form a single complex. The belief is said to constitute knowledge of this fact, provided it fulfills those further somewhat vague conditions which we have been considering in the present chapter. But in regard to any fact, besides the knowledge constituted by belief, we may also have the kind of knowledge constituted by perception, taking this word in its widest possible sense. For example, if you know the hour of the sunset, you can at that hour know the fact that the sun is setting. This is knowledge of the fact by way of knowledge of truths. But you can also, if the weather is fine, look to the west and actually see the setting sun. You then know the same fact by the way of knowledge of things. Thus, in regard to any complex fact, there are theoretically two ways in which it may be known. First, by means of a judgment, in which its several parts are judged to be related as they are in fact related. Second, by means of acquaintance with the complex fact itself, which may, in a large sense, be called perception, though it is by no means confined to objects of the senses. Now it will be observed that the second way of knowing a complex fact, the way of acquaintance, is only possible when there really is such a fact, while the first way, like all judgment, is liable to error. The second way gives us the complex whole, and is therefore only possible when its parts do actually have that relation which makes them combine to form such a complex. The first way, on the contrary, gives us the parts and the relation severally, and demands only the reality of the parts and the relation. The relation may not relate those parts in that way, and yet the judgment may occur. 
it will be remembered that at the end of chapter 11, we suggested that there might be two kinds of self-evidence, one giving an absolute guarantee of truth, the other only a partial guarantee. These two kinds can now be distinguished. We may say that a truth is self-evident in the first and most absolute sense when we have acquaintance with the fact which corresponds to the truth. When a fellow believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, the corresponding fact, if his belief were true, would be Desdemona's love for Cassio. This would be a fact with which no one could have acquaintance except Desdemona. Hence, in the sense of self-evidence that we are considering, the truth that Desdemona loves Cassio, if it were a truth, could only be self-evident to Desdemona. All mental facts and all facts concerning sense data have this same privacy. There is only one person to whom they can be self-evident in our present sense, since there is only one person who can be acquainted with the mental things or the sense data concerned. Thus, no fact about any particular existing thing can be self-evident to more than one person. On the other hand, facts about universals do not have this privacy. Many minds may be acquainted with the same universals. Hence, a relation between universals may be known by acquaintance to many different people. In all cases where we know by acquaintance a complex fact consisting of certain terms and a certain relation, we say that the truth that these terms are so related has the first or absolute kind of self-evidence. And in these cases, the judgment that the terms are so related must be true. Thus, this sort of self-evidence is an absolute guarantee of truth. But although this sort of self-evidence is an absolute guarantee of truth, it does not enable us to be absolutely certain, in the case of any given judgment, that the judgment in question is true. Suppose we first perceive the sun shining, which is a complex fact, and thence proceed to make the judgment, the sun is shining. In passing from the perception to the judgment, it is necessary to analyze the given complex fact. We have to separate out the sun and shining as constituents of the fact. In this process, it is possible to commit an error. Hence, even where a fact has the first or absolute kind of self-evidence, a judgment believed to correspond to the fact is not absolutely infallible because it may not really correspond to the fact. But if it does correspond, in the sense explained in the preceding chapter, then it must be true. The second sort of self-evidence will be that which belongs to judgments in the first instance, and is not derived from direct perception of a fact as a single complex whole. The second kind of self-evidence will have degrees, from the very highest degree down to a bare inclination in favor of the belief. Take, for example, the case of a horse trotting away from us along a hard road. At first, our certainty that we hear the hooves is complete. Gradually, if we listen intently, there comes a moment when we think perhaps it was imagination, or the blind upstairs, or our own heartbeats. At last, we become doubtful whether there was any noise at all. Then we think we no longer hear anything, and at last we know we no longer hear anything. In this process, there is a continual gradation of self-evidence, from the very highest degree to the least, not in the sense data themselves, but in the judgments based upon them. Or again, suppose we are comparing two shades of color one blue and one green. We can be quite sure they are different shades of color, but if the green color is gradually altered to be more and more like the blue, becoming first a blue-green, then a greeny-blue, then blue, there will come a moment when we are doubtful whether we can see any difference, and then a moment when we know that we cannot see any difference. The same thing happens in tuning a musical instrument or in any other case where there is a continuous gradation. Thus, self-evidence of this sort is a matter of degree, and it seems plain that the higher degrees 
are more to be trusted than the lower degrees. In derivative knowledge, our ultimate premises must have some degree of self-evidence, and so must their connection with the conclusions deduced from them. Take, for example, a piece of reasoning in geometry. It is not enough that the axioms from which we start should be self-evident. It is necessary also that at each step in the reasoning, the connection of premises and conclusion should be self-evident. In difficult reasoning, this connection has often only a very small degree of self-evidence. Hence, errors of reasoning are not improbable where the difficulty is great. From what has been said, it is evident that, both as regards intuitive knowledge and as regards derivative knowledge, if we assume that intuitive knowledge is trustworthy in proportion to the degree of its self-evidence, there will be a gradation in trustworthiness from the existence of noteworthy sense data and the simpler truths of logic and arithmetic, which may be taken as quite certain, down to judgments which seem only just more probable than their opposites. What we firmly believe, if it is true, is called knowledge provided it is either intuitive or inferred, logically or psychologically, from intuitive knowledge from which it follows logically. What we firmly believe, if it is not true, is called error. What we firmly believe, if it is neither knowledge nor error, and also what we believe hesitatingly because it is, or is derived from, something which has not the highest degree of self-evidence, may be called probable opinion. Thus, the greater part of what would commonly pass as knowledge is more or less probable opinion. In regard to probable opinion, we can derive great assistance from coherence, which we rejected as the definition of truth, but may often use as a criterion. A body of individually probable opinions, if they are mutually coherent, become more probable than any one of them would be individually. It is in this way that many scientific hypotheses acquire their probability. They fit into a coherent system of probable opinions, and thus become more probable than they would be in isolation. The same thing applies to general philosophical hypotheses. Often in a single case, such hypotheses may seem highly doubtful, while yet, when we consider the order and coherence which they introduce into a mass of probable opinion, they become pretty nearly certain. This applies in particular to such matters as the distinction between dreams and waking life. If our dreams, night after night, were as coherent one with another as our days, we should hardly know whether to believe the dreams or the waking life. As it is, the test of coherence condemns the dreams and confirms the waking life. But this test, though it increases the probability where it is successful, never gives absolute certainty, unless there is certainty already at some point in the coherent system. Thus, the mere organization of probable opinion will never, by itself, transform it into indubitable knowledge. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded in Durango, Colorado. Chapter 14. The Limits of Philosophical Knowledge In all that we have said hitherto concerning philosophy, we have scarcely touched on many matters that occupy a great space in the writings of most philosophers. Most philosophers, or at any rate very many, profess to be able to prove by a priori metaphysical reasoning such things as the fundamental dogmas of religion the essential rationality of the universe, 
the illusoriness of matter, the unreality of all evil, and so on. There can be no doubt that the hope of finding reason to believe such theses as these has been the chief inspiration of many lifelong students of philosophy. This hope, I believe, is vain. It would seem that knowledge concerning the universe as a whole is not to be obtained by metaphysics, and that the proposed proofs that, in virtue of the laws of logic, such and such things must exist, and such and such others cannot, are not capable of surviving a critical scrutiny. In this chapter, we shall briefly consider the kind of way in which such reasoning is attempted, with a view to discovering whether we can hope that it may be valid. The great representative in modern times of the kind of view which we wish to examine was Hegel, 1770-1831. Hegel's philosophy is very difficult, and commentators differ as to the true interpretation of it. According to the interpretation I shall adopt, which is that of many, if not most, of the commentators, and has the merit of giving an interesting and important type of philosophy, his main thesis is that everything short of the whole is obviously fragmentary, and obviously incapable of existing without the complement supplied by the rest of the world. Just as a comparative anatomist from a single bone sees what kind of animal the whole must have been, so the metaphysician, according to Hegel, sees from any one piece of reality what the whole of reality must be, at least in its large outlines. Every apparently separate piece of reality has, as it were, hooks which grapple it to the next piece. The next piece, in turn, has fresh hooks, and so on, until the whole universe is reconstructed. This essential incompleteness appears, according to Hegel, equally in the world of thought and in the world of things. In the world of thought, if we take any idea which is abstract or incomplete, we find on examination that, if we forget its incompleteness, we become involved in contradictions. These contradictions turn the idea in question into its opposite or antithesis, and in order to escape, we have to find a new, less incomplete idea which is the synthesis of our original idea and its antithesis. This new idea, though less incomplete than the idea we started with, will be found nevertheless to be still not wholly complete, but to pass into its antithesis, with which it must be combined in a new synthesis. In this way, Hegel advances until he reaches the absolute idea, which, according to him, has no incompleteness, no opposite, and no need of further development. The absolute idea, therefore, is adequate to describe absolute reality. But all lower ideas only describe reality as it appears to a partial view, not as it is to one who simultaneously surveys the whole. Thus Hegel reaches the conclusion that absolute reality forms one single harmonious system, not in space or time, not in any degree evil, wholly rational, and wholly spiritual. Any appearance to the contrary in the world we know can be proved logically, so he believes, to be entirely due to our fragmentary piecemeal view of the universe. If we saw the universe whole, as we may suppose God sees it, Space and time and matter and evil and all striving and struggling would disappear, and we should see instead an eternal, perfect, unchanging spiritual unity. In this conception there is undeniably something sublime, something to which we could wish to yield assent. Nevertheless, when the arguments in support of it are carefully examined, they appear to involve much confusion and many unwarrantable assumptions. The fundamental tenet upon which the system is built up is that what is incomplete must be not self-subsistent, 
but must need the support of other things before it can exist. It is held that whatever has relations to things outside itself must contain some reference to those outside things in its own nature, and could not therefore be what it is if those outside things did not exist. A man's nature, for example, is constituted by his memories, and the rest of his knowledge, by his loves and hatreds, and so on. Thus, but for the objects which he knows or loves or hates, he could not be what he is. He is essentially and obviously a fragment. Taken as the sum total of reality, he would be self-contradictory. This whole point of view, however, turns upon the notion of the nature of a thing, which seems to mean all the truths about the thing. It is, of course, the case that a thing which connects one thing with another thing could not subsist if the other thing did not subsist. But a truth about a thing is not part of the thing itself, although it must, according to the above usage, be part of the nature of the thing. If we mean by a thing's nature all the truths about the thing, then plainly we cannot know a thing's nature unless we know all the thing's relations to all the other things in the universe. But if the word nature is used in this sense, we shall have to hold that the thing may be known when its nature is not known, or at any rate is not known completely. There is a confusion when this use of the word nature is employed between knowledge of things and knowledge of truths. We may have knowledge of a thing by acquaintance, even if we know very few propositions about it. Theoretically, we need not know any propositions about it. Thus, acquaintance with the thing does not involve knowledge of its nature in the above sense, and although acquaintance with a thing is involved in our knowing any one proposition about a thing, knowledge of its nature in the above sense is not involved. Hence, 1. Acquaintance with a thing does not logically involve a knowledge of its relations, and 2. A knowledge of some of its relations does not involve a knowledge of all its relations, nor knowledge of its nature in the above sense. I may be acquainted, for example, with my toothache, and this knowledge may be as complete as knowledge by acquaintance ever can be, without knowing all that the dentist, who is not acquainted with it, can tell me about its cause, and without therefore knowing its nature in the above sense. Thus, the fact that a thing has relations does not prove that its relations are logically necessary. That is to say, from the mere fact that it is the thing it is, we cannot deduce that it must have the various relations which, in fact, it has. This only seems to follow because we know it already. It follows that we cannot prove that the universe as a whole forms a single harmonious system, such as Hegel believes that it forms. And if we cannot prove this, we also cannot prove the unreality of space and time, and matter and evil, for this is deduced by Hegel from the fragmentary and relational character of these things. Thus we are left to the piecemeal investigation of the world, and are unable to know the characters of those parts of the universe that are remote from our experience. This result, disappointing as it is to those whose hopes have been raised by the systems of philosophers, is in harmony with the inductive and scientific temper of our age and is borne out by the whole examination of human knowledge which has occupied our previous chapters. Most of the great ambitious attempts of metaphysicians have proceeded by the attempt to prove that such and such apparent features of the world were self-contradictory, and therefore could not be real. The whole tendency of modern thought, however, is more and more in the direction of showing that the supposed contradictions were illusory, and that very little can be proved a priori from considerations of what must be. A good illustration of this is afforded by space and time. Space and time appear to be infinite in extent and infinitely divisible. If we travel along a straight line in either direction, it is difficult to believe that we shall finally reach a last point, beyond which there is nothing, not even empty space. Similarly, if in imagination we travel backwards or forwards in time, 
it is difficult to believe that we shall reach a first or last time with not even empty time beyond it thus space and time appear to be infinite in extent again if we take any two points on a line it seems evident that there must be other points between them however small the distance between them may be every distance can be halved and the halves can be halved again and so on ad infinitum in time similarly however little time may elapse between two moments it seems evident that there will be other moments between them thus space and time appear to be infinitely divisible but as against these apparent facts infinite extent and infinite divisibility philosophers have advanced arguments tending to show that there could be no infinite collections of things and that therefore the number of points in space or of instants in time must be finite thus a contradiction emerged between the apparent nature of space and time and the supposed impossibility of infinite collections kant who first emphasized this contradiction deduced the impossibility of space and time which he declared to be merely subjective and since his time very many philosophers have believed that space and time are mere appearance not characteristic of the world as it really is now however owing to the labors of the mathematicians notably georg cantor it has appeared that the impossibility of infinite collections was a mistake they are not in fact self-contradictory but only contradictory of certain rather obstinate mental prejudices hence the reasons for regarding space and time as unreal have become inoperative and one of the great sources of metaphysical constructions is dried up the mathematicians however have not been content with showing that space as it is commonly supposed to be is possible they have shown also that many other forms of space are equally possible so far as logic can show some of euclid's axioms which appear to common sense to be necessary and were formerly supposed to be necessary by philosophers are now known to derive their appearance of necessity from our mere familiarity with actual space and not from any a priori logical foundation by imagining worlds in which these axioms are false the mathematicians have used logic to loosen the prejudices of common sense and to show the possibility of spaces differing some more some less from that in which we live and some of these spaces differ so little from euclidean space where distances such as we can measure are concerned that it is impossible to discover by observation whether our actual space is strictly euclidean or of one of these other kinds thus the position is completely reversed formerly it appeared that experience left only one kind of space to logic and logic showed this one kind to be impossible now logic presents many kinds of space as possible apart from experience and experience only partially decides between them thus while our knowledge of what is has become less than it was formerly supposed to be our knowledge of what may be is enormously increased instead of being shut in within narrow walls of which every nook and cranny could be explored we find ourselves in an open world of free possibilities where much remains unknown because there is so much to know what has happened in the case of space and time has happened to some extent in other directions as well the attempt to prescribe to the universe by means of a priori principles has broken down logic instead of being as formerly the bar to possibilities has become the great liberator of the imagination presenting innumerable alternatives which are closed to unreflective common sense and leaving to experience the task of deciding where decision is possible between the many worlds which logic offers for our choice thus knowledge as to what exists becomes limited to what we can learn from experience not to what we can actually experience for as we have seen there is much knowledge by description concerning things of which we have no direct experience but in all cases of knowledge by description we need some connection of universals enabling us from such and such a datum to infer an object of a certain sort as implied by our datum thus in regard to physical objects for example 
the principle that sense data are signs of physical objects is itself a connection of universals and it is only in virtue of this principle that experience enables us to acquire knowledge concerning physical objects the same applies to the law of causality or to descend to what is less general to such principles as the law of gravitation principles such as the law of gravitation are proved or rather rendered highly probable by a combination of experience with some wholly a priori principle such as the principle of induction thus our intuitive knowledge which is the source of all our other knowledge of truths is of two sorts pure empirical knowledge which tells us of the existence and some of the properties of particular things with which we are acquainted and pure a priori knowledge which gives us connections between universals and enables us to draw inferences from the particular facts given in empirical knowledge our derivative knowledge always depends upon some pure a priori knowledge and usually also depends upon some pure empirical knowledge philosophical knowledge if what has been said above is true does not differ essentially from scientific knowledge there is no special source of wisdom which is open to philosophy but not to science and the results obtained by philosophy are not radically different from those obtained from science the essential characteristic of philosophy which makes it a study distinct from science is criticism it examines critically the principles employed in science and in daily life it searches out any inconsistencies there may be in these principles and it only accepts them when as the result of a critical inquiry no reason for rejecting them has appeared if as many philosophers have believed the principles underlying the sciences were capable when disengaged from irrelevant detail of giving us knowledge concerning the universe as a whole such knowledge would have the same claim on our belief as scientific knowledge has but our inquiry has not revealed any such knowledge and therefore as regards the special doctrines of the bolder metaphysicians has had a mainly negative result but as regards what would be commonly accepted as knowledge our result is in the main positive we have seldom found reason to reject such knowledge as the result of our criticism and we have seen no reason to suppose man incapable of the kind of knowledge which he is generally believed to possess when however we speak of philosophy as a criticism of knowledge it is necessary to impose a certain limitation if we adopt the attitude of the complete skeptic placing ourselves wholly outside all knowledge and asking from this outside position to be compelled to return within the circle of knowledge we are demanding what is impossible and our skepticism can never be refuted for all refutation must begin with some piece of knowledge which the disputants share from blank doubt no argument can begin hence the criticism of knowledge which philosophy employs must not be of this destructive kind if any result is to be achieved against this absolute skepticism no logical argument can be advanced but it is not difficult to see that skepticism of this kind is unreasonable descartes methodical doubt with which modern philosophy began is not of this kind but is rather the kind of criticism which we are asserting to be the essence of philosophy his methodical doubt consisted in doubting whatever seemed doubtful in pausing with each apparent piece of knowledge to ask himself whether on reflection he could feel certain that he really knew it this is the kind of criticism which constitutes philosophy some knowledge such as knowledge of the existence of our sense data appears quite indubitable however calmly and thoroughly we reflect upon it in regard to such knowledge philosophical criticism does not require that we should abstain from belief but there are beliefs such for example as the belief that physical objects exactly resemble our sense data which are entertained until we begin to reflect but are found to melt away when subjected to a close inquiry such beliefs philosophy will bid us reject unless some new line of argument is found to support them 
but to reject the beliefs which do not appear open to any objections however closely we examine them is not reasonable and is not what philosophy advocates the criticism aimed at in a word is not that which without reason determines to reject but that which considers each piece of apparent knowledge on its merits and retains whatever still appears to be knowledge when this consideration is completed that some risk of error remains must be admitted since human beings are fallible philosophy may claim justly that it diminishes the risk of error and that in some cases it renders the risk so small as to be practically negligible to do more than this is not possible in a world where mistakes must occur and more than this no prudent advocate of philosophy would claim to have performed end of chapter 14chapter 15 of the problems of philosophy by bertrand russell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by landon d c elkind at the university of iowa in coralville iowa recorded in durango colorado chapter 15 the value of philosophy having now come to the end of our brief and very incomplete review of the problems of philosophy it will be well to consider in conclusion what is the value of philosophy and why it ought to be studied it is the more necessary to consider this question in view of the fact that many men under the influence of science or of practical affairs are inclined to doubt whether philosophy is anything better than innocent but useless trifling hair-splitting distinctions and controversies on matters concerning which knowledge is impossible this view of philosophy appears to result partly from a wrong conception of the ends of life partly from a wrong conception of the kinds of goods which philosophy strives to achieve physical science through the medium of inventions is useful to innumerable people who are wholly ignorant of it thus the study of physical science is to be recommended not only or primarily because of the effect on the student but rather because of the effect on mankind in general this utility does not belong to philosophy if the study of philosophy has any value at all for others than students of philosophy it must be only indirectly through its effects upon the lives of those who study it it is in these effects therefore if anywhere that the value of philosophy must be primarily sought but further if we are not to fail in our endeavor to determine the value of philosophy we must first free our minds from the prejudices of what are wrongly called practical men the practical man as this word is often used is one who recognizes only material needs who realizes that men must have food for the body but is oblivious of the necessity of providing food for the mind if all men were well off if poverty and disease had been reduced to their lowest possible point there would still remain much to be done to produce a valuable society and even in the existing world the goods of the mind are at least as important as the goods of the body it is exclusively among the goods of the mind that the value of philosophy is to be found and only those who are not indifferent to these goods can be persuaded that the study of philosophy is not a waste of time philosophy like all other studies aims primarily at knowledge the knowledge it aims at is the kind of knowledge which gives unity and system to the body of the sciences and the kind which results from a critical examination of the grounds of our convictions prejudices and beliefs but it cannot be maintained that philosophy has had any very great measure of success in its attempts to provide definite answers to its questions if you ask a mathematician a mineralogist a historian or any other man of learning what definite body of truths has been ascertained by his science his answer will last as long as you are willing to listen but if you put the same question to a philosopher he will 
if he is candid, have to confess that his study has not achieved positive results, such as have been achieved by other sciences. It is true that this is partly accounted for by the fact that, as soon as definite knowledge concerning any subject becomes possible, this subject ceases to be called philosophy and becomes a separate science. The whole study of the heavens, which now belongs to astronomy, was once included in philosophy. Newton's great work was called The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Similarly, the study of the human mind, which was, until very lately, a part of philosophy, has now been separated from philosophy and has become the science of psychology. Thus, to a great extent, the uncertainty of philosophy is more apparent than real. Those questions which are already capable of definite answers are placed in the sciences, while those only to which, at present, no definite answer can be given, remain to form the residue, which is called philosophy. This is, however, only a part of the truth concerning the uncertainty of philosophy. There are many questions, and among them those that are of the profoundest interest to our spiritual life, which, so far as we can see, must remain insoluble to the human intellect until its powers become of quite a different order from what they are now. Has the universe any unity of plan or purpose, or is it a fortuitous concourse of atoms? Is consciousness a permanent part of the universe, giving hope of indefinite growth in wisdom? Or is it a transitory accident on a small planet on which life must ultimately become impossible? Are good and evil of importance to the universe, or only to man? Such questions are asked by philosophy, and variously answered by various philosophers. But it would seem that, whether answers be otherwise discoverable or not, the answers suggested by philosophy are none of them demonstrably true. Yet, however slight may be the hope of discovering an answer, it is part of the business of philosophy to continue the consideration of such questions, to make us aware of their importance, to examine all the approaches to them, and to keep alive that speculative interest in the universe, which is apt to be killed by confining ourselves to definitely ascertainable knowledge. Many philosophers, it is true, have held that philosophy could establish the truth of certain answers to such fundamental questions. They have supposed that what is of most importance in religious beliefs could be proved by strict demonstration to be true. In order to judge of such attempts, it is necessary to take a survey of human knowledge and to form an opinion as to its methods and its limitations. On such a subject, it would be unwise to pronounce dogmatically. But if the investigations of our previous chapters have not led us astray, we shall be compelled to renounce the hope of finding philosophical proofs of religious beliefs. We cannot therefore include, as part of the value of philosophy, any definite set of answers to such questions. Hence, once more, the value of philosophy must not depend upon any supposed body of definitely ascertainable knowledge to be acquired by those who study it. The value of philosophy is, in fact, to be sought largely in its very uncertainty. The man who has no tincture of philosophy goes through life imprisoned in the prejudices derived from common sense, from the habitual beliefs of his age or his nation, and from convictions which have grown up in his mind without the cooperation or consent of his deliberate reason. To such a man, the world tends to become definite, finite, obvious. Common objects rouse no questions, and unfamiliar possibilities are contemptuously rejected. As soon as we begin to philosophize, on the contrary, we find, as we saw in our opening chapters, that even the most everyday things lead to problems to which only very incomplete answers can be given. Philosophy, though unable to tell us with certainty what is the true answer to the doubts which it raises, is able to suggest many possibilities which enlarge our thoughts and free them from the tyranny of custom. Thus, while diminishing our feeling of certainty as to what things are, it greatly increases our knowledge as to what they may be. It removes the somewhat arrogant dogmatism 
of those who have never traveled into the region of liberating doubt, and it keeps alive our sense of wonder by showing familiar things in an unfamiliar aspect. Apart from its utility in showing unsuspected possibilities, philosophy has a value, perhaps its chief value, through the greatness of the objects which it contemplates, and the freedom from narrow and personal aims resulting from this contemplation. The life of the instinctive man is shut up within the circle of his private interests. Family and friends may be included, but the outer world is not regarded except as it may help or hinder what comes within the circle of instinctive wishes. In such a life, there is something feverish and confined, in comparison with which the philosophic life is calm and free. The private world of instinctive interests is a small one, set in the midst of a great and powerful world which must, sooner or later, lay our private world in ruins. Unless we can so enlarge our interests as to include the whole outer world, we remain like a garrison in a beleaguered fortress, knowing that the enemy prevents escape and that ultimate surrender is inevitable. In such a life there is no peace, but a constant strife between the insistence of desire and the powerlessness of will. In one way or another, if our life is to be great and free, we must escape this prison and this strife. One way of escape is by philosophic contemplation. Philosophic contemplation does not, in its widest survey, divide the universe into two hostile camps, friends and foes, helpful and hostile, good and bad. It views the whole impartially. Philosophic contemplation, when it is unalloyed, does not aim at proving that the rest of the universe is akin to man. All acquisition of knowledge is an enlargement of the self, but this enlargement is best attained when it is not directly sought. It is obtained when the desire for knowledge is alone operative, by a study which does not wish in advance that its objects should have this or that character, but adapts the self to the characters which it finds in the objects. The enlargement of self is not obtained when, taking the self as it is, we try to show that the world is so similar to the self that knowledge of it is possible without any admission of what seems alien. The desire to prove this is a form of self-assertion, and like all self-assertion, it is an obstacle to the growth of self which it desires, and of which the self knows that it is capable. Self-assertion in philosophic speculation, as elsewhere, views the world as a means to its own ends. Thus, it makes the world of less account than self, and the self sets bounds to the greatness of its goods. In contemplation, on the contrary, we start from the not-self, and through its greatness the boundaries of self are enlarged. Through the infinity of the universe, the mind which contemplates it achieves some share in infinity. For this reason, greatness of soul is not fostered by those philosophies which assimilate the universe to man. Knowledge is a form of union of self and not-self. Like all union, it is impaired by dominion, and therefore by any attempt to force the universe into conformity with what we find in ourselves. There is a widespread philosophical tendency towards the view which tells us that man is the measure of all things, that truth is man-made, that space and time and the world of universals are properties of the mind, and that if there be anything not created by the mind, it is unknowable and of no account for us. This view, if our previous discussions were correct, is untrue. But in addition to being untrue, it has the effect of robbing philosophic contemplation of all that gives it value, since it fetters contemplation to self. What it calls knowledge is not a union with the not-self, but a set of prejudices, habits, and desires, making an impenetrable veil between us and the world beyond. The man who finds pleasure in such a theory of knowledge is like the man who never leaves the domestic circle, for fear his word might not be law. The true philosophic contemplation, on the contrary, finds its satisfaction in every enlargement of the not-self, in everything that magnifies the objects contemplated, 
and thereby the subject contemplating. Everything in contemplation that is personal or private, everything that depends upon habit, self-interest, or desire, distorts the object, and hence impairs the union which the intellect seeks. By thus making a barrier between subject and object, such personal and private things become a prison to the intellect. The free intellect will see as God might see, without a here and now, without hopes and fears, without the trammels of customary beliefs and traditional prejudices, calmly, dispassionately, in the sole and exclusive desire of knowledge, knowledge as impersonal, as purely contemplative, as it is possible for man to attain. Hence also the free intellect will value more the abstract and universal knowledge into which the accidents of private history do not enter, than the knowledge brought by the senses, and dependent, as such knowledge must be, upon an exclusive and personal point of view, and a body whose sense organs distort as much as they reveal. The mind which has become accustomed to the freedom and impartiality of philosophic contemplation will preserve something of the same freedom and impartiality in the world of action and emotion. It will view its purposes and desires as parts of the whole, with the absence of insistence that results from seeing them as infinitesimal fragments in a world of which all the rest is unaffected by any one man's deeds. The impartiality which, in contemplation, is the unalloyed desire for truth is the very same quality of mind which, in action, is justice, and in emotion is that universal love which can be given to all, and not only to those who are judged useful or admirable. Thus, contemplation enlarges not only the objects of our thoughts, but also the objects of our actions and our affections. It makes us citizens of the universe, not only of one walled city at war with all the rest. In this citizenship of the universe consists man's true freedom and his liberation from the thraldom of narrow hopes and fears. Thus, to sum up our discussion of the value of philosophy, philosophy is to be studied not for the sake of any definite answers to its questions, since no definite answers can, as a rule, be known to be true, but rather for the sake of the questions themselves because these questions enlarge our conception of what is possible, enrich our intellectual imagination, and diminish the dogmatic assurance which closes the mind against speculation. But above all, because, through the greatness of the universe which philosophy contemplates, the mind also is rendered great, and becomes capable of that union with the universe which constitutes its highest good. End of chapter 15 and end of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell